Greetings. I'm Elizabeth Emery, producer and host of Hear Her Sports, the podcast about exceptional female athletes and women in sports. Before we get started with Olympic rower Felice Mueller, a few quick notes. One, check out my other podcast, Off the Front, to meet Martina Brimmer in episode six that just posted on January 1st. Martina is an adventurer and cycle tourist. In the episode, though, we mostly talk about her life as a businesswoman and entrepreneur. She is the co-founder of Swift Industries, a bike bag maker in Seattle, Washington. I really love her energy, her philosophy about making everything locally, and her good ideas. So please take a listen at wisports.com under the Listen tab. Two, find links to the things Felice and I discuss on the episode at hearhersports.com podcast page. And finally, subscribe to the newsletter at hearhersports.com and get a free link to the Spotify playlist of favorite workout songs of many of my guests. Joining me today is Olympic rower Felice Mueller. In Rio Olympics, she placed fourth in the pair. Since then, she switched to sculling in a single and finished seventh in the World Championships just this September. And at the end of October, she won the Lotman Challenge, a three-race series with a big purse and equal prize money for both men and women. Welcome, Felice. I'm really glad that you're here. Yeah, me too. I'm glad this is happening. So can you start off by filling in some of the details about the Lotman Challenge? This was a really exciting and totally new event that the Philadelphia Gold Cup Regatta put on. The Gold Cup Regatta is a race that they invite the best scholars in the world to come and compete for quite a lot of prize money, but they usually only invite, I think, five different scholars. And one year, they didn't even have, for the men's side, like a men's USA single scholar in the mix. It was all international people. So uh, this past year, it's the first year of the Olympic cycle, and worlds were pretty late this year. And so they decided to do something different, and they decided to focus their efforts on getting U.S. athletes to get more involved in sculling and to show up to a lot of these big races that, I mean, quite honestly, a lot of the elite rowers don't really go to, like elite nationals and um, head of the Charles and head of the Schuylkill just because we're training and busy and don't really want to have to plan for a race and have to travel. But It was really cool and I think really successful because it got a lot of athletes, first of all, into the single because it was only, um, you could only compete if you were racing in a single event. And it also really heightened the competitive level of those regattas. And so I think overall it was a great success. And from the outside, it looks like it's really important that the check was so big and also that the check was the same for men and women. Is that, do you guys feel the same? Oh, yeah, for sure. I can honestly say I probably wouldn't have participated if it was not so significant. I won $9,000 and that almost, like, almost doubles the amount I make per year on my Olympic stipend. Um, I mean, not quite, but it's a really significant amount of money to, uh, row like elite rowers who are trying to train full time. So that was awesome. And the fact that men and women got the same amount of prize money was also, I mean, it's interesting to me because I, always feel like our two teams are equal so the fact that both men and women were getting nine thousand dollars didn't really seem like a huge victory for female athletes but when you ask that question it is a huge really great thing that they want to invest the same amount of money into both men's and women's rowing i think that's great yeah congrats to whoever put up that money i think it's awesome yeah, me too. How do you normally fund your training? You said that you have an Olympic stipend, and do you work? Um, yeah, last quad, I would work part-time. Um, for most of the quad, I was a junior coach um, after practice for Mercer Junior Rowing, and they were fantastic working around our schedule and our competing and uh, training schedule. So that was 
really great. And I also worked briefly at a juice bar that one of the host families owned. So they also were very accommodating when we'd have to go overseas and race for, you know, three or four weeks. Um, so last quad, I would kind of do some part-time work, but also being in the system, being here at the Princeton Training Center. And last year, the women's single wasn't a funded boat class, but this year, if I'm able to win the spot again, it is a funded boat class. So I will not have to put up the money to go to World Cup or go to the World Championships. So that makes it a lot more feasible. You just have to find enough money to live. Right. That's a big um, difference. Yeah, it's a it's a really huge difference. And and you know, like I like how you said that you were working at a juice bar by somebody who knows what it means to have to head off for three or four weeks. It's hard to find a job like that. <laughs> not every yeah, not every so, employer is going to let you do that. <laughs> no, I remember when I first moved here, I applied to a lot of jobs, and some were kind of more serious jobs and some were just retail jobs and everyone was like we can't hire you if you're gone for half a year <laughs> I was probably too upfront at the fact that like my schedule changes week to week and half a year I'm going to be in California or over in Europe but it it was pretty hard to find someone who is accommodating to that was this the Lotman challenge one of the reasons you started doing the single no I I was doing the single just kind of to stay in shape while I was figuring out if I wanted to keep training. <laughs> uh, I guess you want to keep training. Yeah, yeah. It t- turns out I do want to keep training. My boyfriend, who has been a scholar for a long time and was in the single last year, told me about this challenge, and I, at first, didn't really even consider doing it myself because I I don't even know why. I just didn't really think of myself as training hard at that point. But then I realized that, like, no, I, if they're putting up this prize money, you might as well just go and race and get some more experience racing in the single. And um, so that's kind of why I signed up to do it. And Tom Terhar, the coach at the Princeton Training Center, was generous enough to let me use uh, one of the training center singles to train in while I was at the University of Michigan taking classes and coaching. And kind of out of necessity, I decided to sign up for the spring speed order in the single, which I did mostly to ensure that I would keep training and not just take too much time off. And when I went and raced there and won and then started training more seriously and then went to a World Cup and did well at the World Cup. I kind of felt like, well, this is actually pretty fun and I like that it's just me and maybe I should try and row in the single for a bit longer. So that's kind of how that developed. Yeah, it's definitely different not having a a partner. Yeah. You You can train whenever you want, for example. Yeah. Yeah. You can train when you want. If the boat doesn't feel good, you know, it's only your fault. (laughs) You, uh, it's, it's kind of nice. It's kind of refreshing just having to manage only yourself. And if I'm not feeling good, if like my back doesn't feel good or my rib doesn't feel good, I can cross train and I don't feel bad about letting my teammate down or teammates. So it's pretty nice. I read somewhere in the in your coverage of the Lotman Challenge, you said, you know, you didn't want to flip. Do people flip in racing at your level? Yeah. Really? They do. Wow, that um, would be terrible. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Someone might have even flipped this summer at the World Championships, but I remember a few World Championships ago, Andrew Campbell, he's a really, really talented lightweight single sculler. And he flipped his oar, caught a buoy, and you just Ugh. go right over. So it happens. Oh, it's not unheard of. Wow, that's terrible. So this might be a good time yeah. for you just to talk a little bit about single sculling and maybe some of the, I don't know, some of the details about it and and why you could flip. Yeah. 
Yeah, the bow is tiny. So in my single, uh, it's for, I'm at the max weight limit for it. So I'm pretty big for the single that I'm rowing. And you're, the seat at some t- sometimes is above the gunnel, so above the edge of the boat. So you're kind of even sitting a little outside the boat. And it only weighs what, like, I don't know, 40 pounds maybe. No, it's probably lighter than that. I wish I actually knew, but it's very light. You can carry it by yourself but really, really fragile. If you hit something with it, if you put your foot in the wrong place in the boat, it will just crack, like your foot will go right through or the whole bow will just like crumble off. So it's really, really fragile. Are you traveling with that boat? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, you have to load it on the trailer or I'm actually after this week gonna load up my friend's car with three different singles and we're going to drive all the way down to Miami and so it is pretty scary there have been incidents where a boat won't be strapped down tight enough and we'll just go flying off on the highway oh that's great which is dangerous (laughs) for everyone involved and for sure uh the boat will not make it no when you're going to Europe are you flying with the boats what's how are they getting there no over in Europe Uh, Like last year when I went over to travel and race, I rented a boat from the boat manufacturer whose boat I use, and they just delivered one to the course, and I used it in Europe. And that's, um, I think, what a lot of athletes typically do with the U.S. Training Center. They have a container of boats over in Europe that they'll ship to wherever the regatta is, so they have you know, their own boats over in Europe and then their own training boats over in the United States. And is it easy to switch boats? Like, do you notice that you're racing in a different boat? It's it's pretty easy because it's the same mold, but a lot of parts of the boats are still kind of, they have to be handmade. So you do notice some little differences. Well, boats will feel different and it's you don't want to be too much of a diva, like, oh, this just doesn't feel right. But I think it does take a couple of days to get used to rowing a new boat. I didn't really notice so much this summer, but I'm also new to single sculling. And then I was also able to race my own boat at World since it was in the United States. But in the pair, I would sometimes notice, like, it feels a little heavier or it feels like the boat doesn't run quite in the same way or it's maybe down to one side a little bit more than it usually is it's just like little things that don't feel normal and that could also be you're just fresh off a red-eye flight and you're right. maybe not feeling great right, but right. but I do think it takes a little bit of getting used to rowing a new boat are there things that you don't like as well about the single I'm still not used to sculling yet. That's probably the thing I don't <laughs> like. <laughs> My left hand is not is still kind of struggling to figure out what it's supposed to be doing. And I tend to still twist to my port side and kind of collapse to my port side because that's what I've done for the last 12 years. So just getting used to a different movement, really. What are you doing to... I would imagine you have to sort of balance yourself out in some way through strength training or something. Yeah. Last year, I worked a lot on trying to strengthen the left side of my back um, and kind of shoulder area. And then coming to the training center this year, I've been working with the PT, Mark, who's fantastic and have continued to work on my shoulders, but also my hips and glutes and just trying to get a more solid base so that everything can work together yeah what do you think makes you a a good rower and now a good scholar I don't really know I but I think that for whatever reason I have pretty good boat feel I think I'm able to feel on the water when I'm connected and when I should let the boat run and how much pressure I should put on 
as the boat is moving. And I think that, I don't know, I don't know why I'm good at that, but I don't think I, in the past or even now, have rowed particularly well. And I'm not, I'm definitely not the fittest person here at the training center. So I think that it must have to do with how I feel the boat responding to my movement. That's cool. Have you always had that or is that something you worked on? I want to say that I think I've always had it. I I mean, for sure, I've had to work on rhythm and I've changed a lot where I let the boat run or how I let the boat run, like where my hands are, if I pause, if I breathe. Um, But I remember when I was trying out for the junior national team, I was having a miserable time and I really wanted to go home and I was not being put in good boats and I got one seat race for the eight and I I kind of this is awful but at the time I was like oh I don't really care if I do well or not in the seat race because I wouldn't I really would not mind just leaving and going home but like that being said of course I still tried but I remember like my boat just took off and that was the first time I'd really been seat raced against someone in high school I always had a fast erg score so they kind of just put me in the boat but at that moment I was like oh wow like you know I can move a boat that's pretty exciting wow that is cool I always think it's interesting when athletes find their sport and you know there's like your ability to do that I mean there's no like real explanation it sounds like yeah I don't really think so I don't really know why I would be better at that than other people but I have a feeling like that has to be a, the case I don't know mm-hmm. you you also did a lot of other sports in school and for some reason the rowing stuck I mean maybe maybe it's all connected yeah yeah I think I did a lot of other sports that I really really liked my favorite was JV hockey and I wish I had better been better at some of those other sports because they were so fun but yeah rowing somehow stuck because it was hard but challenging and and I happened to be pretty good at it so I kept showing up and look at me now I'm still doing it (laughs) so rowing's not fun (laughs) well I don't I don't want to say that because it is I absolutely love it but In high school, when, you know, all winter I was playing ice hockey, and that's like a game, and you're invested and interested in it for so many other reasons other than just being, like, the best skater out there. And then rowing is, like, incredibly fun. You get to race, you get to compete, you get to work with your teammates and, like, figure out how to make yourself move through the water the fastest but it's also just a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of individual pushing of yourself for you know one six minute race if you're lucky it's six minutes (laughs) do you like competing I really like competing I love competing I think that part of the reason why I came back to the training center this year even though I want to keep training in the single is last summer and spring I had so much fun training because I was training to compete and I think once you get into the long winter where you're just putting in a lot of minutes and trying to get fit I I didn't think I was going to like that as much and I think I needed to be around a team to help me to do it. You mentioned early on that this is the first year of the Olympic cycle. Could you talk a little bit about sort of how that works and and what it means that it's the first year? Yeah, I think I didn't really understand this last quad when I was going through this all for the first time. But in the first year, everyone who's gone to the Olympics the year before has probably taken quite a bit, the longest amount of time off that they've taken in four years. 
and there are a lot of new and developing athletes coming in to take the place of athletes who maybe aren't going to compete this year or have decided to retire. So I think that this first year of competing is generally pretty relaxed. And as you get closer and closer to the Olympics, it starts to ramp up a little bit. Like this year, I think is also kind of relaxed, but on the horizon is Olympic qualification. And then Olympic qualification is, you know, you have to be on to make us to get a spot in the Olympics. And then, of course, at the Olympics, you got to be peaking. So it definitely ramps up throughout these four years. When are qualification races? We're going into 2018. Those will happen in 2019. The 2019 World Championship, based on how you place, you can either secure a spot for 2020 or if you don't, then in 2020, they have a, a last chance selection regatta where you can go race. And if you're, you know, top one or two, you get the last couple spots to go. Do you have a four-year training plan, sort of an arc of what you expect to to be working on for the next three years? No, I do not. But the team that I'm training with does. So... um I'm putting a lot of trust in the fact that Tom and Laurel, the coaches here, have done this a lot of times, which they have. Right. And um, based on my experience last quad, it's it's just kind of building up the endurance. And then at the end, you start building the intensity. And so it's it's kind of like when I was racing in college, you have – your year and it ends with NCAAs and that's when you're peaking. And for the Olympic quad, you have that whole year, but you spread it out over four years. Right. And you said that you were heading to Miami. Yes. Yeah. Right after uh, the holidays, I will be driving down to Miami to train there for six weeks. Then I will go to Chula Vista, California to train with the larger sweep team, and then I'll come back to Princeton. So talk a little bit about training, and you know we can focus on what you're going to be doing in Miami since you'll be able to get some sun and warmth down there. Yeah. You know, like how much weight training do you do, and you know, like what are you going to be working on most down there? I'm, I'm going down there to work mostly with a coach who has really, really helped me technically. And so down there... I think there will be a high technical focus and working a lot on the stroke and kind of figuring out how to do the right things as the rate starts to come up. So especially in January, it's not really time to start racing yet. So I think we'll be doing a lot of slower steady state workouts and then some, some longer, more intense workouts, but they're still going to be a lower cadence than what race pace is. Um, For most days, we'll be doing that. I probably will continue to lift three times a week, and I think uh, two of those lifts will be more strength-based lifts, and then one will be a little bit more endurance and quickness. What kind of uh, exercises are you doing in the gym, strength training? I like to do mostly Olympic lifting. That's what I did in college, and that's kind of what we do here at the training center. Um, definitely squats and, you know, cleans and deadlifts. Um, but also, I need to work on my arms. Last year, I kind of neglected them because I hate lifting with my arms because they're generally pretty weak. But, you know, bench press, bench pull, shoulder press, all those kind of workout right do you like working in the gym I do I really like lifting I but like I said I like lifting with my legs I don't <laughs> don't like lifting with my arms so much but that kind of just goes to show you that there's a lot of gains that can be made there if I focus on that right do you do you do a lot of core strength stuff yeah for sure like I said earlier, I've been working on kind of strengthening my core and back and glutes and shoulders throughout last year and into this year, because that's the platform I need to step off of. And I think that 
having a stronger core is going to help me in the boat. It's going to help me stay injury free and it's going to help me execute the technical things I want to do a little bit better. So that focus is always there. Do you think you'll ever get to a point where you're not having to worry about the technique? I mean, in sweep, did you get to that point? Uh, I would say certainly not in sweep and, and certainly not as an overall answer. I think that the cool thing about the rowing stroke is there's so many different ways to do it. And I'm working on changing my stroke a lot, but I think that, and this happened, I think last quad is you work on something for so long. And then because you're working on one thing for a while, you start to kind of lose a separate thing. So then you have to work on the separate thing and your stroke is kind of always changing and evolving. And um, of course you want to make it more efficient and you want to make it longer and all this stuff. But, um, but there's always work to be done in my opinion. I hope one day I can get to a point where I'm like, Nope, this is it. I got it. (laughs) But I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to actually happen. Right. Do you ever get to go out and just have fun row? Like just go out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are times when I'm really trying to work on making a change. And I think those are the hardest times, even above really tough workouts, because you're just thinking the whole time you get off the water and your body is tired because you're trying to make it do something it's not used to. And your mind is tired because you've been thinking about it the whole time. But once you hit a certain point, doing that kind of stuff. You just need to take a break and go out and just enjoy the water and the scenery and how the boat feels and have some fun rows. What's your favorite workout? Ooh, I really like doing short on-off bursts. So like 10, 15, 20 strokes of max power and pressure and then a similar like 10, 15, 20 strokes off just paddling. That is for sure my favorite workout because I love seeing how fast you can go. And I also love paddling. It's perfect. Tell me about the tech gear that you have on your boat. Like what, what numbers do you watch? Oh yeah. Um, we use this great stroke coach. Well, I guess it's a speed coach and it has a GPS system. So while you're rowing, I can see how many strokes I'm taking per minute, how fast I'm going over 500 meters, and how far I've gone. Cool. So typically I practice on a buoyed course, so I always know how far I'm going. But if I'm not, I can set workouts and it will tell me when 2,000 meters is done and how fast I've gone per 500 of that 2,000 meters. So it's really cool. Yeah, I, I like following techie stuff. That's cool. I read somewhere and you'll have to tell me the full story, but you had a coach that was really influential for you and for thinking about going to the Olympics. Is that, am I getting that right? Yeah, for sure. My high school coach, Vanessa Thorne, I think she really paved the way for what I'm doing now. I remember her calling me into her office my sophomore year and Like I said, rowing for sure in high school wasn't the funnest sport for me. And I didn't like going to practice most days. I didn't really like being on the rowing team, especially in my freshman and sophomore year when I was just kind of starting out and figuring out what the sport was about. And this coach, number one, would all like – would have never let me stop rowing. I think she just knew that I was going to be great in the sport and she was going to make sure I was going to show up. And then number two, she would, because of that, she would make me or not make me, but have me check in with her every couple weeks or so in the off season. And, and she would also make sure that I would stay in touch with the rowing motion throughout the off season we would only practice in the spring and I remember coming in and kind of telling her what numbers I was seeing on the workouts I was doing and this was my sophomore year and she told me 
I feel like kind of out of the blue that she could really see me going to the Olympics one day. And I remember being there and, and kind of laughing about it and seemingly maybe I was just trying to brush it off and make her think I, you know, Oh, whatever. Like, I don't believe you or something, but I remember walking out and my hands were like shaking and I I think she really helped ignite something because when I was in fourth or fifth grade, I really wanted to go to the Olympics and I didn't know how I was going to get there. And then she, of course, just baits me with that. And I had to keep showing up. That's so cool. Yeah. Was her being a woman influential? Yeah, it was for sure. I thought that she had been a rower in high school and in college and had rowed outside of college and I thought she was such a badass she was so strong I felt like she could do anything I always wished that she could jump in our boat and row with us and um I think having a strong woman to look up to when you're in high school and uh kind of trying to figure out what it means to be a woman when you're in high school and going through a lot of changes and and wondering if you're normal or not, that was definitely influential. It was cool to have someone to look up to and feel like I want to be like her rather than, you know, any other number of celebrities or females who are very present in our media. And then in college, what was your coaching like? In college, I was coached by Mark Rothstein. He's been the head women's coach at the University of Michigan since it became a varsity sport, so over 25 years now. And um, he had all female assistant coaches, one being Brett Sickler, who had uh, just missed the 2008 Olympic team, but she was awesome to me she had been in the women's eight that had won gold at every world championships prior to that and I think it was really tough for her to not make the team but it didn't make her any less of a role model in my eyes and so it was great to have and I should also say Brett was also a University of Michigan alum so having her around and being so invested in the sport and so invested in being a strong athletic woman, I can say for sure that all of us on the team thought she was so, so cool. I meant to ask this before, but what didn't you like about rowing when you were rowing in high school? Again, I think, I think a big part of it was just that the sport was really hard. (laughs) And, you know, I would come home from practice and my hands would be like all torn up and bleeding and kind of pussing and when your hands are like that and you try and wash your hair, it's like it burns so badly and I was constantly sore. And then you have to go back the next day and your hands hurt and your body hurts and it's snowing out. And it's just like, and you have to go do the same stroke, you know, over and over again. And you're also in high school rowing with all these kids who've probably never rowed before. So the boat's offset and, um, also rowing at Pomfret was kind of like a little bit of a nerdy sport. All the really athletic, cool people did lacrosse in the spring. And so rowing was kind of like an amalgamation of people who just were there because they had to do a sport and rowing is something that they could do. And people who are there because they're genuinely interested in it. And so I think when I got to the University of Michigan, it was incredible to be on a team with all these women who are just so excited to be there and be as strong and as fast and as competitive as they could be. In high school, it was, uh, you know, we had a, a first boat and a second boat who were really, really motivated and excited to be there. And then we had quite a few athletes who just were kind of showing up to fulfill their athletic requirement. And I don't know, it just, it took a little while to fall in love with the sport for me. 
I, I rode for a little bit here in, in Cleveland. And one of the things that I found really hard was, you know, and I'm masters and, it, you know, it's a whole different thing, but, you know, having to rely on so many people. Well, that's interesting for me. I suppose in high school, like, you're not going to have high schoolers who are like, oh, I can't go to practice today because I have something else to do, which might happen more on master's rowing. But the opposite thing would happen for me in high school and in college. I would feel so much pressure to perform for the, the eight other people in my boat. Or in high school, it was four other people because we rode fours. And I struggled for a long time trying to believe and be confident that what I was doing was enough and I didn't need to you know I didn't need to put the whole team on my back because I felt like they were doing the same thing for me yeah so you're for the next four years you're going to be your three years you're going to be working on on uh, the skull like, what do you think you're going to take from rowing? You mentioned confidence, you know, like into the next phase. Yeah, rowing Rowing has taught me so much. I was just having lunch with my friend the other day who is in town for a brief period of time, and we trained together last quad, and I made the Olympics and didn't do as well as I, I wanted to do, and she didn't even make the Olympic team, and we were both talking about how last fall we kind of felt like, well, you know, what was the point of that? That was really stupid. We didn't do what we wanted to do. And now we've wasted four years, but then having some time last year being kind of back in the rhythm of the real world, it was pretty amazing to me to feel like that was not for nothing. I've, learned so much in the past four years like I've become for sure much more confident in myself as a person and in my ability to set goals and achieve them but also I feel confident in my own body I don't mind being a tall strong large woman which is something that in high school and college I kind of struggled with quite a bit and I also learned a lot about how to work with teammates and how to manage a lot of different people and personalities and I think the biggest thing is just learning how to keep showing up I mean there are times training for the Olympics where I would be sobbing in my car before practice and just not know how I was gonna be able to complete a workout and the workout wouldn't even be hard it was just like I was so exhausted I had pushed myself so hard I didn't know how I could keep doing it and you just keep showing up because you know that's what the dream is all about and I think that having that learning through sport that kind of tenacity and finding something within yourself that's kind of deeper than just you know, a personal goal, it becomes, um, it becomes like an energy that's outside yourself that's pushing you. And I think that becoming connected to that and, and knowing that you can do much more than you believe you can has been a really, really incredible life lesson. And I feel so lucky that I'm able to have this life lesson because I think about my my mom, I think about my grandma who they didn't really have sports growing up and if they did it you know I don't think a lot of people really took female athletes seriously and here I am in 2017 feeling like yeah obviously the men and the women rowers are going to get the same amount of prize money because we're doing the same thing. It's taught me so much. I'm so lucky. Wow, that that was <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Sorry, it's <laughs> Thank a little you. dramatic, but I feel so strongly that being an athlete is an incredible, incredible tool for anyone. 
I think too, you know, like it's so hard to understand how tired you can get mentally and what that does. And, you know, like it does lead to sobbing in your car before practice because you are so tired. Well, I just have a funny story. I remember like one day after practice, I was, I needed to stop and grab some food on the way home because I was really hungry. And I stopped at this sandwich place and the woman behind the counter was like, Hey, good morning. Like, what can I get you today? And I started bawling, sobbing. I had to walk out of the store. I was so embarrassed. But like, at that point, you can't control emotional outbursts. It's just like, I don't know, you get so worn down that there's like, no line there. Right, right. And how how does your mom feel? Is she a sporty person? What you know, like, you must have it genetically. So did she do sports? Um, My mom actually was a five time national champion synchronized skater. She was sporty. She was sporty. (laughs) And she got involved in that much later in life. But both my mom and dad, although they were never really serious athletes, they've been sporty their whole lives. My dad still loves to play squash and he goes to the gym almost every day. And my mom does yoga and goes walking and she used to be an ice skater. My family definitely enjoys being active and getting out there and doing things. I have a question for you because you're obviously way younger than I am, but do you think that women your age athletes are as thankful as you are for, you know, the women that came before and for Title IX and, you know, feel thankful that they're able to do what what they're doing in athletics? I can say... In terms of rowers, I think we're generally, at least on the elite level, pretty aware of all the work that the women did before us to get Title IX to happen. And as I've gotten older and kind of able to have a little bit more perspective on the incredible opportunities I've been given as an athlete compared to, like, my grandma when she was in college, she had to fulfill an athletic requirement and it was basketball or square dancing. And she was a square dancer. It's like, it's just mind boggling. And I can imagine that, or at least I hope that other female athletes who are competing in college and benefiting from Title IX appreciate that and think about that every time, you know, they're get to go on a training trip or have a recovery table or training table. Um, But I, I don't know about the generation who's much younger than me. I, I also don't know about other sports. I, I think rowing kind of has a, a storied history in the, in title nine and its creation. So perhaps, as a rower, I'm a little bit more attuned to it than other athletes, but I guess long story short, yes, me as an athlete and my friends uh, for sure think about Title IX and think about everything that we have now and how thankful we are. It's interesting you say that about rowers because I have talked to other rowers and they all seem very aware of Title IX, so that's that's yeah. very cool. We're ready to wrap things up. Is there anything that we didn't get to that you'd love to talk about? One of the first questions you asked me how I fund my training, I did want to mention, which I sadly didn't before, that the Cleveland Foundry funded my trip to Switzerland for the World Cup this past summer. And without them, I don't know if I could have gone. And I don't know, I guess I wanted to take some time to thank them and give them a shout out because they have done some really, really incredible things on the river, and I'm really excited for all the programs they're offering to youth and masters and even kind of developing a sort of elite level program there. It's really incredible, so did want to give them a shout out. That's cool, and a shout out to Cleveland, too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank thank you so much. I really appreciate you for finding time. I know you're very busy and the holidays are coming up, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. 
Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please tell your pals about it. No, really, I mean right now. Send an email to one friend just to say these women are awesome. And also remember to sign up for the newsletter and get the link to a Spotify playlist of favorite workout songs of some of my guests. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Bye-bye.